So in this video, we're going to start to introduce the major adaptations that plants fashioned in order to colonize land and then in order to spread further and further on land. So we're eventually going to discuss this whole cladogram, but in this video, we're just going to discuss these first two major adaptations. We'll see that um, green algae are kind of thought to be uh, uh, related to modern plants, but are not plants themselves. They still live in aquatic environments. So we'll see uh, what was required to help plants um, exist on land in the first place, and then what happened after that that helped them to succeed more and more. So let's start by thinking about the photosynthesis equation, because really when it comes to thinking about plants and their priorities, we really want to think about the three major requirements for photosynthesis. Plants need carbon dioxide gas, they need water from the soil, and they need sunlight to be able to drive the process. And on land, the major concern is dehydration because cells are really watery and in the dry air, water will go from high to low concentration and leave the organism potentially a lot. And so we'll see that really all of the organisms that uh, fashioned adaptations to live on land are going to need some way to hold the water in and prevent it from leaving. So let's start by thinking about the cuticle and the guard cells of plants. Um, cuticle is really their solution to uh, the, the speed of water loss out of their bodies. Cuticle is basically a secretion or a substance that the outer cells release onto the outside of the plant. And for our purposes, the cuticle is a waxy or fatty substance, and it's also clear. Maybe we could discuss clear first. Clear just makes sure that the, the sunlight energy can still go through the cuticle to reach the cells inside of the leaf. So um, clear is important, but waxy or fatty is also important because that also uh, prevents water from escaping so easily. Um, here's a really neat picture of actually water on the outside having trouble going in. Um, but for the most part, if we think about um, the inside of a plant, here's kind of a view if you imagine cutting a, a plant leaf and then kind of like looking at it from its side and zooming in, then maybe this is the top of the leaf and this is the bottom of the leaf and now we can actually see like inside of it. It might look something like this and what I really want you to imagine is that there's a really high amount of water inside of a leaf. And so again, without this cuticle layer, which is really an orange here, um, remember that it's like a substance that's released by the outermost cells. Without that cuticle layer there, this water would be rushing to the dry air from high to low concentration really fast. Um, but again, because that cuticle is fatty, maybe you remember that like water and oil don't mix, and so this water doesn't want to cross that fatty barrier very fast at all. Uh, it's kind of like Vaseline. Um, if you ever have really chapped lips, um, you're putting a fatty or waxy layer to slow the water loss um, to help your, your lips heal. Okay, so that's cuticle. Um, now you can't have cuticle everywhere as a plant because as it turns out, you've got to have some pores or some holes that allow the gases to cross. Remember that you not only need water for photosynthesis from the roots, but you also need carbon dioxide gas to come in, and you need to be able to let out the, the oxygen gas that you produce as well. And so we just, uh, we call these pores in the leaves, very small holes, stomata. Um, but the problem with stomata is that if you're letting in these gases in and out, you're also giving a chance for water to escape. And so again, the potential concern of plants is what if they're losing too much water? Well, um, the solution is that they also have these guard cells around their stomata pores, and those guard cells can protect against too much water loss. So here's kind of a really neat microscopic view here. This little hole here is the stomata, or the stoma is singular, um, and around it are the guard cells. And again, the idea is that if the stomata control um, the gas exchange, then the guard cells can make sure that you don't lose too much water because they can actually close. If my hands kind of here are the uh, guard cells, then they can close the stomata to, to really slow down water loss, and they can open back up to allow gas exchange when the plant kind of maybe gets more water from the soil. 
All right. So with those major adaptations, plants are able to survive on land, and that enables us to talk about our first group, which we could call the non-vascular plants, and for our purposes, we can basically think moss. So moss are plants. Um, they're very small plants, and they generally are only found in really wet places. And so let's kind of think about why they're so limited. Um, there's really two reasons. Number one, they're really small because their leaves have to be really kind of close to the ground where the water is because their ability to move the water to their leaves is somewhat limited. Um, and then the second reason that we're going to see with both of our plant groups in this video is that in order to sexually reproduce, just like their aquatic ancestors, they depend on water being around in order to carry the sperm from one part of the plant to the egg in, the, in, the, in another part of the plant or from plant to plant. And so they depend on that water being there so the sperm can get to egg and make offspring. As it turns out, when sperm make offspring, they make these um, little tall little tower structures that have the offspring at the very top. And then they kind of release their offspring as spores to the wind so that the, the, maybe the moss can grow somewhere else. Okay. Um, but that's um, a major reason why you won't find moss in dry places because if they don't have that water, then they can't reproduce sexually. Okay, so let's talk about our uh, one more major adaptation in this video. Let's talk about this vascular tissue. So that's something that moss don't have, but all of our other plant groups, as we're going to see, do have. For our purposes, vascular tissue is just kind of a set of tubes um, inside taller plants. Plants can grow taller with vascular tissue because essentially these tubes can carry water long distances up to the leaves, um, and they can also carry sugar um, that the leaves make through photosynthesis down to the rest of the plant. And so we're going to get taller plants with vascular tissue that can now compete for the sunlight that they're trying to get to for photosynthesis. Okay, so let's think about um, a plant group that has both um, land adaptations and vascular tissue. We call that group the seedless vascular plants. Not a very exciting name, um, but for our purposes we can just think ferns. Um, ferns are obviously much taller than moss, so they have that vascular tissue that enables them to put their leaves pretty high up. But as it turns out, they still have that reproduction problem that moss had. In order to get sperm to egg, there once again must be this film of water that helps carry them there. And so we're going to see ferns, kind of like moss, still in, in mostly very wet areas, certainly not in like dry grasslands. Okay, So we're going to see that in future plant groups, there's going to need to be a better solution to getting sperm to egg um, than just relying on water being present. Um, so we've seen the transition to land and we've seen this water restriction in both of our early plant groups.